please rise for the family. And you can be seated. On behalf of the family, just uh, thank you. We know this is a busy week with Easter, but uh, thank you for coming today and uh, celebrating the life of Dwight Vinsky. And uh, we are here to celebrate because this man loved Jesus, and we're going to talk a little bit about that and where he is and how we can see him again. And so uh, I know that Marguerite and Julie and family appreciate the care and love you've given up to this point and will continue even after today. So let's pray together. Our Lord, we come to you today. We think about when you were on earth and this was a difficult week for you as you faced the cross and paid for our sin debt. And then, Lord, as we celebrate Sunday, you rose from the dead, giving us the hope of a resurrection and so we thank you that Dwight knew that, and we thank you for his response to the gospel. We pray today, Lord, as we celebrate his life, um, that we would get some glimpses of what made him so special, as well as, Lord, to know the Jesus that he knew. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing, and the family can remain seated if they like. Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his cleansing blood atoning, and I repented of my sins and won the victory. Story. And 
He knew that he couldn't do that. And then it goes on to say in verse 6, In all the ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. And we're talking about Christ making our paths straight. And that's the most important thing today. Did you know that? All the getting together and the food that's going to be later and all of that, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing that Dwight would want us Pastor Al's going to get in that is to tell you about who Jesus is and what he did for Dwight. So Dwight's safe now because of his knowledge and faith in Christ, okay? Now, I wanted to bring this with me because uh, this we have in our home, and this is from Dwight. And some of y'all may not know this, but there was a blanket laying out front, and uh, it was made by Dwight. This was made by Dwight. And so we have that in our home now, and I thought about it and how the precision of this and just how perfect it is. It was so perfect that you can't see it, but back here on the back, you know what it says? It says, handmade by Dwight Vinsky. He put his name on it. You know, sadly, sadly, there are too many things out here in life that we do that we don't want people to know we did it, right? But Dwight wasn't ashamed of his work right here. And Dwight wasn't ashamed of the work that he did for Christ. So it's an exciting thing to know that. And I want to read some more verses right here, okay? So this is some more verses that he uh, thought a lot of, that he really enjoyed. And so I'm going to share those with you today. And it is in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 through 10. And listen to this. It says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and our transgressions made us alive together with Christ. See, there was a precision there that Christ did through God the Father that brought Jesus to this earth. And did you know that same Jesus 2,000 years ago was the one that one day Dwight fell on his knees and decided to join up with? There was a precise thing done by God through his son that made everything available to Dwight, just like he will to us if we know him as our personal Savior. And it goes on here to say, but God, uh, but even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ by grace. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And verse 7 says, so that in the ages to come, the riches of his grace and kindness surpasses everything toward Christ. And verse 2, 8, and 9. This is a commonly known verse but it's so full of theology that it just should shake you to your bones and it says for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself it is a gift of God and the apostle Paul says so that we can not boast in verse 10 for we are his workmanship we are his workmanship you and I Dwight was his workmanship he put the whole thing together, and he sent his son here to take care 
uh, the wife, as he can take care of us. So the preciseness of this little quilt, like the one out front, was very important to Dwight. But the most important thing to Dwight, the most important thing was his preciseness in his faith, knowing who Jesus was and knowing what he had to do to become a part of him. So Dwight's safe. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out to celebrate our grantees' lives. We really appreciate it. I'd like to share a, uh, a quick selection on uh, Christ's love for us. Ephesians 3, 16 through 21. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I took it upon myself to say a few words about my dad. I'm not sure why I did that now, but, <laughs> but I'm sure I'll be glad later. Um, thank you all so much for coming and for being a part of my family's life for all of these years, all of your support and all of your love, and it just means a lot that you came here today um, to celebrate my dad's life. And I do want to thank everyone at First Baptist um, of Lexington here because they have been amazing. They have made this time so much easier I really didn't have to think about anything today that um, Pastor Ralph and Margo and uh, Roy and everyone here has just been so helpful. So big thanks to them. But I do want to make sure we all realize that we've been, we are calling it a celebration for a reason. And um, in February, when I knew my dad was starting to go downhill and he was in the hospital, and to be honest, I thought he was going to pass at that point. And um, I hadn't had that conversation with him, and he didn't really, I don't know, nobody said, hey, you know, you're dying. And so I thought I would broach that with him, and I was alone, and I said, um, you know, I think you're at the end of the road now. Um, are you okay with that? And um, he said, uh, of course, <laughs> like, why wouldn't I be, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> that was very reassuring. Um, but I'm just going to tell you a few little things about our childhood and all. So I'm, and I'm going to read it because uh, I don't know how to get through it. Um, the earliest memory I have my, of my dad is coming home from work, and he would lay the newspaper down on the floor. And um, he had this really soft little buzz cut that was fuzzy, and I was small. And he'd be on the floor reading, and I could just like lean my head, lean my head on his little soft head. <laughs> and that's one of the earliest memories that I have. Um, I was not afraid of my dad. He was not the disciplinarian in the family. That was my mom's job. <laughs> but he did have his own special form of torture for us. Um, and I called that the Saturday at the antique auction. <laughs> Y'all ever been to an antique auction? <laughs> uh, my mom, dad, brother, and I would spend endless hours in a crowded, smoke-filled room just waiting, waiting, and waiting for the chance to buy something old. <laughs> I honestly couldn't think of a single reason for being there other than just, you know, making my, us kids miserable. <laughs> but you guys probably have been to their house and have seen some of the nice antiques that they picked up. So it wasn't all for nothing. Um, 
Now, if you know my dad, he grew up in the Depression era, and he was very thrifty about money. He was very careful. But when I got a little bit older, I figured out that um, that didn't apply to everything. There were some things that he really did love to buy. <laughs> some of you guys know what that is. So when I graduated from high school, I decided to capitalize on that. And instead of going to our senior trip to Bahamas, I asked my dad for a stereo. Well, the next moment, I think, I think it was like 10 minutes later, we we're in the nicest shop in all of, you know, Columbia. And I ended up, you know, we spent a lot of quality time together in that store. And I think he enjoyed it very much. And I ended up with a very nice Harman Kardon speaker, Infinity, no, Infinity speakers. Carmen Cardin receiver. I don't remember the turntable for you young ones. That's um, a record player, if you even remember that. And you know, in their t in, in y'all's terms, um, it was pretty dope. It, my husband was very impressed with my setup. <laughs> um, you may not know that my dad worked for a tech company. He worked for National Cash Register which doesn't seem like high tech right now, but at the time it did seem like that. And um, we were, it was corporate um, in Dayton, Ohio, and they had this great big place called Old River where um, the families could come, like the biggest pool I've ever seen in my life. And it had like a river with canoes and all of this stuff. So as I look back on it, I'm like, well, maybe that was like the Google of its time. I don't know, but it was pretty impressive. And when I think about it, so that was a tech company of the time. Um, and my dad loved, he had a passion for technology. I think you guys probably know that. He was one of the very few people that I know that in their 90s, they were on Facebook. <coughs> and he even put himself on Facebook Live a couple times, <laughs> which was <laughs> really cute. He didn't know that he'd done it, but he'd be looking into the camera for about five minutes. <laughs> now, this is really, really cute. Um, he loved cell phones. He loved um, CD players. He loved anything. He loved his computers, all of these things. Um, so he just really did, and his brother Mark, who's still alive, he's 11 years younger, um, said that he always had that fascination with technology, with new technology. Um, so my relationship with my dad has really grown sweeter and sweeter over the years. I came to realize that he and I were a lot more alike than I ever realized. Um, when I was younger, I thought he's this like engineering type, and I'm an artist, and I'm creative, and we're nothing alike. But the older we <laughs> I got, the more I realized that we are really a lot alike. He's a, he's a journal collector. He has tons of journals and he writes everything down and, and I am too. And he really had a passion for learning that just really went all the way into his 90s. And um, I have that too, so I guess I got that from him. He actually started taking piano lessons in his 40s and he attacked that like everything else. He practiced every single day, you know, we could hear him playing raindrops keep falling on my head or something like that. He did that every single day. And he also is now, you know, he taught himself to quilt in his later years. And he did that with such beauty. He did such a beautiful job on all of these quilts. And we have these like as heirlooms for our family now. And they are very, very beautiful. A couple of things that I did not know about my dad that my uncle Mark recently um, shared with us is that he was accomplished clarinet player in his younger day. I did not know that. I knew he had a clarinet, but his brother said he was accomplished. And he, he had a beekeeping operation, <laughs> and I did not know that, <laughs> with the full garb and everything. Um, so, yeah. He said, Uncle Mark said that uh, my dad corrected him once for singing secular words to the tune of a hymn and, and told him that that was sacrilegious. Don't do that. So um, one of the things I love the most about my dad is that he was always grateful. He was always happy. Every time I came over to see him, he'd be like, oh, there's my daughter. You know, he'd say, she's so pretty. You're so pretty, he said, but not as pretty as her. He would point to my mom. <laughs> And he would just say, you know, oh, I'm so thankful to have this place. Isn't it nice? He'd show us their apartment or, you know, I'm just so grateful that you're my daughter. And he'd give me a hug and that sort of thing. And he was just always praising the Lord and always very thankful for everything that he had. Um, so all that to say, oh, and I am grateful for both of my parents because they made Jesus their Lord. And they've given us a spiritual legacy 
that continues. My dad was passionate about telling people about Jesus, um, which I think is pretty awesome. So I'm not worried about my dad at all. He is really having a good time now, and um, we'll see him soon enough. So thank you all again for coming. God bless you. We've only just begun to live White lace and promises A kiss for luck and we're on our way We've only begun Before the rising sun place where there's room to grow and yes we've just begun And now if the family remains seated, let's stand again and let's sing a wonderful hymn called Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, oh what a fortune. 
taste of glory divine, there is salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all day long the day long. Dwight was a farm boy, he grew up on a dairy farm milking cows, and he defied the odds. He went to college, Michigan State, and he became an engineer research and design, and then he landed a job with RCA. I had to Google RCA, so they developed their first black and white television set in 1939. Dwight was 10 years old, and it went to the market in 1946. And, if you could afford one, color was available four years later. Dwight was on the cutting edge of technology. He would later change his jobs, and he would work for NCR, National Cash Register, another high-tech company. Well, he lived to be 94 years old. He and Marguerite have been married for 67 years. He worked on radios. Julie reminded us, collected antiques, learned to play the piano in his 40s, and uh, quilted. So he never quit growing and learning and trying new things. He had a tender side to him, and uh, I saw that, but he was also tenacious. Uh, when debating Marguerite, as he, being an engineer and a thinker, was trying to get his point across, he would often walk out of the room and would come back and he'd say, and one more thing. Y'all remember Columbo? Just one more thing. He and Marguerite have been members of our church for 14 years. They joined February the 10th, 2010. A favorite memory of mine and a challenge I'm going to give you in a moment. A guest speaker by the name of Don Sunshine. Don came and he uh, challenged our church to be uh, more bold in witnessing and sharing the gospel. And uh, while I didn't find the exact track that he had, uh, after that meeting, he talked about the value of a gospel pamphlet. And uh, if we would only hand them out to people, uh, our responsibility isn't to save souls, but to be the messenger of Jesus who saves souls. But what surprised me a little bit was because Dwight was always so quiet. But he would come to church, and he would tell me with this passionate 
glee in his eye, uh, let me tell you what happened. And he would tell me about a person at the grocery store or a person at the restaurant or a person at the gas pump, someone that he had handed a gospel tract to and engaged in a conversation about Jesus. Okay, now, here's your homework. I got these tracks. Steps to Peace with God. Here's one, Are You Ready? by Billy Graham. All right, I'm putting them right here. Not double dog dare you. After the church is over, our service, just get one or two. You don't have to get them all. But in memory of and in celebration of a life well lived that handed out the gospel, would you take one of these and in the next week to two weeks hand one out and remember what Dwight did? Because sometimes some of us, we just need a little shove, right? A little push. So, will you do it? If you will, don't forget, come grab your track. Well, as I think about Dwight, Romans 1.16 came into mind. For I am not ashamed of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God, saving everyone who believes. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses at the grocery store, in the restaurant, over the back fence with the neighbor, with the delivery person. Let us not forget, fellow believers, that if you know Jesus, while we have time, we need to let people know Jesus still saves. And so, in thinking about how to share the gospel, and I think that's my one responsibility today, is to tell you how you can see Dwight again. I wanted to do it in a unique way. So my grandkids, they love this little cash register. And uh, this is a scanner. I got to turn it on. Wait a minute. Yeah. And this is clean up on aisle four. Aisle four, we got to clean up. And yeah, and 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 so they play with this thing. And there's the and and, and all the groceries. And and so in, in true cash register spirit. Why? Because. Uh, Dwight worked at the National Cash Register uh, Company, and in its day, that's what they first began to uh, sell. Of course, they went into computers later on and other things. But, um, but if you think about a cash register, have you noticed how much groceries cost now? Uh, yeah, you're, you're paying a lot more for groceries, aren't you? I mean, it, the, the, it's accumulating, the, the, the bill. I mean, you, there you go. You got your buggy and all, all ching, 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 and then, the, and then you got to kind of hold on when they tell you the price, right? Have you ever thought about how our sins accumulate, how they can add up? This bill can, can, can be large. Job said this in 14.1, Job in the Old Testament, man who is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. It doesn't take long to, um, that sinful nature comes out, doesn't it? Now, we have a, a one-year-old, a three, two three-year-olds, and two five-year-old grandkids. And I mean, sometimes it's, I'm playing referee. And, uh, man, they don't want to share because whatever toy one has, the other one wants it. And, and we are a few days, and we're just full of trouble. James says it this way, though, as we continue to grow up. Temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, then it gives birth to death. And so you and I all know what it is to struggle, to be tempted, and then to give in to the temptation and to, yes, do the very thing God said we shouldn't do. Psalms 40.12 says it this way, Troubles surround me, too many to count. My sins pile up so high I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs of my head. I have lost all courage. Isaiah 59, 12, similar. For our sins are piled up before God, and they testify against us. Yes, we know that we are sinners. And so I want you to just think from a cash register standpoint. So a few groceries, before you know it, it accumulates. It adds up. You think about your life. If you were to add up all the sins that you've ever committed, Someone suggested this illustration in a witnessing endeavor. If you only sin three sins a day, 
from the moment you got up to the moment you went to bed at night. I mean, mad, uh, didn't do something you should have done, said something you shouldn't have said. Only three a day. All right, mm, that's a good day. I'd say a pretty good day. Three a day, 365 days a year, over a thousand sins in a year. Uh, Dwight Vinsky lived 94 years. 1,000 times 94 is what? 94,000. And so whatever your age is, 64,000. How do you think you would do if you stood before the judge and you had 64,000 sins on your record? You think he's just going to sweep it under the rug? No big deal. No, that's what this week's all about, right? So one, I wanted to say our sins are like a debt that must be paid. The U.S. government, <laughs> well, they've got a debt so big it can't be serviced anymore which is somewhat indicative of our journey in life. And so if you think you're going to get to heaven by living a good life, and maybe you could be good enough to squeak in, I'm here to tell you that your sins have piled up way much more than you are really realizing. So what do we do with these sins? Well, we have to realize we are spiritually bankrupt. We, we have to come to a point, and I think this is one quality of Dwight Vinsky, humble. Wouldn't you say humility? He was a humble man. And, and there comes a point in our life, and sometimes some of us, we're so prideful, and we're going to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, and, but we've got to humble ourselves. Matthew 5, 3 says this, God blesses those who are poor in spirit because they realize they need him. We get to a point when we realize if we're just really honest with the holy God creator, we're like, mm, compared to God, you know, there's a lot of things in my life that haven't been right, and there's sin. And Isaiah 118 says this, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are, can I say, piled high, God the Father says, I can wipe them away. I can forgive all of them. You say, is this even possible? Well, Jesus paid a debt he did not owe, and we owed a debt. We could not pay, which gives me my last thought. Salvation is a free gift, but it's not cheap. This is the verse that Jim read. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You say, well, why do you say it's expensive? Well, it's free to us, but it's expensive because 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. And so as you think about Dwight's life and legacy, I think he would say very clearly to you, to me today, um, he's not in heaven because he was a sweet man. He's not in heaven because he was a good daddy. He's not in heaven because 67 years of marriage, look at that. Not many people go that long. He's in heaven today because he has a Savior named Jesus that went to this earth, died on a cross, shed his blood, and, it, and for whosoever shall call upon him shall be saved. And so before you cash out, you need to make sure that you're right with God. And the only way to be right with God is to have God's Son, Jesus, as your Lord and Savior. Have you accepted Him? Do you know Him? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And my encouragement would be to you, don't miss heaven. God went to great expense so that we could enjoy it. And life will pass by, though 94 years is certainly a long time to live, but really, it's a blink of an eye, especially compared to eternity. And the Bible says very clearly that the soul of man will either spend eternity in heaven or hell. And so, we need to consider, have we responded to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ? Will you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father, I pray for my friends who have come today. I stand with them as a sinner in need of a Savior. 
I thank you for Dwight who was bold and would give out the gospel and would clearly tell people this good news. And if there's anyone in the sound of my voice, Lord, today that is yet to respond by accepting you, I pray that today could be the day of their salvation. Before they pillow their head tonight, that they would say, Jesus, I'm putting my faith and trust in you. Forgive me of my sins. And our prayer is for Marguerite and Julie and Mac and the family here to go with them to bring good memories and guide them along the way as they continue the journey. For I know in heaven, the white will be cheering them on. So, Lord, help us to live well and to finish well the race set before us. And we pray this in Christ's name. And everyone said, Amen. And one more thing. This key right here, the grandkids sometimes lose it. This is what opens the register. The key, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have time, you are welcome to join them over in the fellowship hall, which is directly across the street. And we have food to feed 50 people. So the first 50 people <laughs> that get there will have lunch, and else will pray that the fish and loaves multiply. All right.